is good. My name is Robbie Morrison. Let me introduce my wife. This is my wife, Carol. I come April 26th of next year, next year, next month. We'll be married 46 years. God's been good to us. Amen. We have three children, uh, all three of them in the ministry. Our oldest, our daughter's married to a young man named Ryan Overfelt. Ryan and Melissa, and we'll tell you a little bit more about it tonight if you come about the Heirloom Seed Project. It is a part of our ministry directed specifically to ministry kids. It started out as, pre as uh, missionaries kids. It's still just escalated into ministry kids. You know, the sad thing is, folks, we're losing three out of four children who grew up in ministry homes. Yeah. And they're going to the feel-good churches yeah. and or they're going the way of the world. And so God put upon our heart to try to do something in some small way to curb that so that that's what they do. Then our oldest son, Tim, is married to a young lady named Sarah and uh, her and him and her. He's the pastor of the, this is a great, I love this church, his name, Rescue Baptist Church uh, in Pilot Mountain, North Carolina. He gets to see Andy and Opie and all of them, amen. But uh, he pastors there, took a church that had seven people. And they're running about 130, 135 every Sunday yeah. now. God's been good to them. So then our youngest one, Alan, is married to a young lady out of our home church in New Philadelphia, Ohio, Amy. And he pastors the Calvary Baptist Church in Woodsville, New Hampshire. He's a Yankee. Y'all pray for him, amen. <laughs> he has been totally converted, amen. He is a Yankee. But God's been good to us and our family. We have five grandchildren. Grandchildren's your reward for not killing your kids. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So praise the Lord. Take your Bibles. Find if you would 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. We're excited to be here. I'll take a little more time tonight to talk to you about the ministry. But it's our privilege to work with Dr. Don Snow, Calvary Baptist Church in New Philadelphia, Ohio, in what is called All Points Baptist Mission. We have, we was looking at yesterday, we have 43 missionary families, uh, 24 chaplain families uh, that we work with. Uh, Calvary is an endorsing agency for military chaplains, and so that's a unique part of our ministry. And so we'll tell you a little bit more about that tonight, but uh, God has been good. Amen? Amen. Yeah. I am a hillbilly from West Virginia. The preacher talked about that this morning. He, he said a guy went to West Virginia, told a joke about West Virginia, didn't go over well, amen? amen. It's kind of like your family, amen? <laughs> we can talk bad about them, don't you talk bad about them, amen? <laughs> amen. You know, the best thing ever come out of West Virginia, though, was I-79 going north, right? <laughs> I, I tell people, you do know the term redneck originated in West Virginia. It's true. It's a true story. The Southern coal fields of West Virginia, when they were trying to yeah. protest against the, the mining companies, they wore red handkerchiefs around yeah. their neck to go to work to, as a visual protest. And so that's the word where the term redneck came from. It's went a long way from there, amen. amen. <laughs> we won't go there, amen. But yeah. praise the Lord. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. We're excited to be here. We love your preacher and his family. I, I believe God wants to do something in this place, amen. Amen. The spirit that I felt in the morning service in Sunday school and now, it's just good. Amen. And when that spirit's in a place, God is going to do something. Amen. So you just need to keep following that spirit. 2 Corinthians 8. If you found that and you can physically stand, you'll stand for the reading of the word of God. Keep your Bible open to 2 Corinthians 8. We'll be looking at a lot of scripture in 2 Corinthians 8 and other places. But I'll read the first five verses. He said, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to, for to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Praying us with much entreating that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I pray, Father, thank you for your goodness and mercy. 
I pray, Father, you'd meet with us today as only you can, and we'll thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, Paul is writing to this church at Corinth, and we're in the midst of a rainstorm. Amen. Amen. That's don't worry about that, folks. I've preached in, in storms when they had to hold the tent down. Amen. And tent moves. Wow. It don't bother me. Amen. But Paul's writing to this church at Corinth. You've got to understand the background. Get it in your mind who he's writing to. Paul goes out on the first missionary journey. He goes over into what we would call the area of Turkey. Uh, in, in this day and age, and, and did the first missionary journey, comes back, Acts chapter number 16, he goes out on the second missionary journey, and, and wonders, not that things didn't happen on the first journey, but things that we see that change the course of, uh, of history, of missions, and history of the gospel, happened in that second journey. And so he, he's headed on that second journey, and he's like some people, and we talked a little bit about it in the morning service. He said, I want to go here, and the Spirit of God said, you can't go there. And then he said, how about over here? And the Bible says, and the Spirit forbade him not. And so finally, he stopped, and he and listened to God, and he has the Macedonian vision. Here's the, the Macedonian call. And then the Bible says immediately, he said, we endeavored to go over to Macedonia, as surely gathering that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. And he goes over, heads over to Macedonia. First place he ends up is in Philippi. And then he goes from Philippi over to Thessalonica, Thessalonica to Berea. And he covers what we would call the area of Macedonia. Now, if you're looking at a map in your mind, you think about where Greece is. And north of Greece was what would be called the area of Macedonia. Matt, the area of Greece in Bible times was Achaia. And when Paul leaves Macedonia, he goes down into Athens, of course, and, and then over into Corinth. And, and that's when the church at Corinth was started. And that's the area of Achaia. He refers to that. Look in chapter 9. He refers to them as the people from Achaia. He says in verse 1, For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia. That's the churches north of there. That Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. You know, when I read that verse, and uh, uh, you don't mind if I move around a little bit when I'm right. preaching, man. When I, when I read that verse, I'm reminded who Paul is writing to. He's writing to the church of Corinth. You read 1 Corinthians. This is not a real spiritual crowd, amen? amen. And he is correcting all their carnal problems, all their, their, their sin problems. But yet, when you get to 2 Corinthians and you get to this passage of Scripture, he's admonishing them that their zeal, right. their desire to do something for God had provoked many people. Amen. And what is he talking about in this passage of Scripture? Their zeal. He said, Achaia was ready a year ago. What were they ready to do? He, now, in 2 Corinthians 8, he's talking about the gift, their investment that the churches of Macedonia had made in the, in the ministry of Paul. That's what Philippians chapter 4 talks about when he says, Not that I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Look in chapter 10. Paul explains a little bit more of the investment of the churches of Macedonia. In chapter 10, when he's writing to the church at Corinth, and he says in verse 9, And when I was present with you and wanted, now he's talking to the church at Corinth, he said, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And all things I have kept Myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. Read verse 8. I love verse 8. He said, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them. What? To do you service. Now you have missions explained in a real simple term. Amen? Paul's at Corinth preaching the gospel to them. Uh, he said, when I came to you, when I was present with you, when I came there to give you the gospel, I didn't take anything from you. He said, I robbed other churches. Now, he wasn't meaning physically. He went and robbed them, amen. amen. But he said, I took from them what I needed. He, he said, even when I was here and I needed things that you didn't provide, the church, the, the brethren from Macedonia came over and provided that. Paul explains that in Philippians chapter 4. He said, for even once and again, you sent unto my necessity. See, they didn't have the mail we have now. You couldn't mail a check 
to a missionary. So how did the missionary get the support? They took it to him. Yeah, right. So he said, when I was over here, the churches of Macedonia came and supplied my, my needs so I could give you what you need. That's exactly what we're talking about. Amen. I mean, you send a missionary that read the, the prayer letter from the missionary in Uganda. An American cannot get a job in Uganda. They cannot. They cannot work there. So how are they going to survive? The churches of Uganda do not have the resources to provide for them. Amen. So how does he do that? He takes it from us. Amen. And he does the service of God for them in Uganda. That's what he's talking about. That's the things that Paul is explaining to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Isn't the Bible just wonderful? Amen. Yeah, hey, hey, listen, I, I don't know about you, but it's amazing. The more I read it, the more I get out of it. Amen. And, and, and so he's, he's writing to this church at Corinth that's not super spiritual, but he's saying, hey, you did something that provoked some other people. What was it? You got involved in giving to missions because he said a chaos was ready a year ago. Look in chapter eight. I'm just laying the groundwork. Hang on. Amen. amen. Usually it takes me five days to preach all this. <laughs> But he gets to 2 Corinthians 8 and he says in verse number 10, he said, Preacher, why have a missions month? Why have a yearly thing we give to missions? Because it's biblical. Amen. He says in verse 10, here and I give my advice for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. So you're making a faith promise commitment. You're being forward. Amen. You're not going back and doing something you should have done. You're making a commitment to do something forward in the future. Amen. amen. So that's this. Amen. It's, it's like the preacher said. It's not your tithe. The tithing is scriptural. Somebody say amen. amen. If you're not tithing, you're a God-robbing, worthless Christian. Mm -hmm. wow. wow. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. Where it's a man rob God. He said in tithes and offerings, amen. I said that one day they got the same reaction, amen, when I passed him. He just called us a robber. No God called you a robber. Amen. So he said tithing's right. Missions is right. It's that gift, that supply to the needs of the preacher being sent to do the work of God. You're supplying that need, amen. And so it's right to do that, and it's right to be forward a year ago. That's why he said a chaos was ready a year ago. Your zeal hath provoked many. What I got a feeling is Paul went around to the churches in Philippi, Berea, and Thessalonica, and Galatia, and Ephesus, and said, you ought to hear what them people down in Corinth are going to do. Yeah. <laughs> Their zeal hath provoked many. I was telling the preacher last night, I, I just finished a couple weeks ago a missions conference in Piedmont, Missouri. You say, where's that at? You can't get there from here. You've got to go somewhere to go there. Amen. <laughs> it is out in the middle of nowhere. Amen. Amen. Little old town. I think there's six, 7,000 people in that town. It's not very big. And that church runs about 160 people. And, and, and the pastor there called me and said, we've never had a missions conference. Will you come and preach for us? Man, I'll tell you, this is fun. I mean, got there 42 years, never had a missions conference. They supported missionaries, but they'd never done faith promise. So Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday after banquet, Sunday morning, Sunday night, I just preached on faith promise. Man, you talk about exciting, boy. They're just sitting there looking at me like, one lady came up to me weeping. She said, I've never heard this. Why have we never heard this? And so took up their first faith promise. 160 people on a Sunday morning in a country town in Missouri. Smile. $126,000. Their zeal has provoked many. Amen. You know what, folks? They, they didn't have a bunch of rich people in that church. They didn't have people, uh, big lawyers and doctors. They had a bunch of people on uh, beef cattle farms and, and, and chicken farms and, and, and people that, uh, that just, just worked here and there in the mines and places like that around there. And why? Because they just got a hold of the principle of God and did what God said to do. Amen. Amen. And so they... This is what Paul's talking to this church at Corinth. Now, I want you to, there's two or three things I want to say to you. First of all, first of all, this whole thing he's talking to them about is an intellectually right decision to make. Amen. 
You see what you mean intellectually? Look at this verse. Look in verse number uh, 15. He said, for if there first be a willing mind, yep. it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to any hath not. You get down to verse number 19. He says, and, and not that only, but who was also chosen of the chur churches to travel with us with this, with this grace, which is administered to us by us to the glory of the same Lord and the declaration of your ready mind. Yep. You said, preach what are you saying? It's an intellectually right decision to make. It's what the Bible says to do. Amen. Amen. That we are to sustain us. I, I taught in Sunday school out of Matthew chapter number 10. I want to thank God we don't live back in those days. Amen. Because the way God did it back then is he, they come to your house, knocked on your door, said peace be unto you. If you had the same God that they had, they come to your house and they ate and drank whatever you gave them. You were to sustain the servant of God on his journey. Amen. And that's the way it worked. And that's the way Paul's, what Paul's talking about here. That we need to have a ready mind. A willing mind. Amen. We understand the truth. I've had people say. A lady said to me one day. She said, that, that faith promise stuff is something you invented to get more of our money. I said, I, I said, ma'am, if we wanted more of your money, we'd have a spaghetti dinner. And you would show up and pay whatever we ask you to pay because you've got something in return. Amen. Well, hey, the Bible's true. We're to tithe. We're to give to missions. Can I come down here for just a minute? My wife said, don't run up and down them steps too many. That's a lot of steps up there, bud. <laughs> now listen. It, now think about that. It's the right thing to do. We're to tithe. And then Paul talks about the, the gift given to him by the churches of Macedonia. The wages that he took from the church of uh, the churches of Macedonia in, in uh, James James describes it in James chapter 5 in verse number 4 he said behold the hire of the laborers who reap down your fields yeah. hey we need to pay the laborers to reap our fields amen, amen. so it is the right biblical teaching are y'all with me amen, amen. Yeah. people people want to argue she said the people say well it's not in the bible Faith promise, the word faith promise. Well, he calls it this grace in this passage of scripture. Call it grace giving. I don't care what you call it. Yeah. You can call it purple ducks. I don't care. <laughs> it's not what you call it, it's what you do. That's the important thing to do. Amen. Yeah. Missions giving, faith promise giving, grace giving, investment. If you want to call it paying the wages of the labor, I don't care what you call it. It's the right biblical thing to do. Amen? Yeah. So it's an intellectually right decision. Now, can I say to you, look back in this passage of Scripture, it's an emotionally right decision. Mm -hmm. Look what he says in verse uh, here in verse number 8. He said, I speak not by commandment, but by the occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. He, in verse 24, he says it again. Wherefore, show you to them and, the, and before the churches the proof of your love yes, and of our boasting on your, on your behalf. Hey, folks, listen. It was no coincidence in John chapter 20 when Jesus turned and looked at Peter and said, Peter, you've done all this. Now, Peter, do you love me? He said, yeah, Lord, you know I love you. He said, then what? Do something. Amen. Feed my sheep. Yep. Accomplish something. Hey, folks, listen, isn't it amazing? We can get emotional about everything in the world, but we say, well, now we don't want to get too emotional about this thing of giving, giving, giving. Hey, folks, we ought to get emotional about it because if we don't give, people are going to die and go to a place called hell without Jesus Christ. That ought to stir us up. Amen. Yeah. Uh, we read the passage in Matthew 9 this morning. And he said, and when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Yes. Compassion is an emotion, amen. amen. Compassion is, is, is something that ought to move us. I mean, we go in these stores, these convenience stores. I don't know if you do it around here, but down home, you know, in these convenience stores, some, some little girl's running for the snow princess, and she's got a little can on, on, the, on the table there, and you, you're supposed to give us a little bit of money so she can be the snow princess, or somebody's house is burnt down and you're going to give a little money to help them get back in their house and we get all worked up and all excited about that. Why don't we get excited about the things of God? Amen. Yeah. It is emotional. Amen. amen. We are, we're proving our love. God proved His love to us. Amen. For God so loved the world yeah. that He gave His only begotten Son. So He proved His love to us. Now let's prove our love for Him. Amen. Yeah. 
It is something. It's emotionally right. I get, I get stirred up. Man, when I was pastoring, every time a missionary would come, I'd want to go there. Amen. Amen. I get stirred up about that. Sure. I, I saw one of the missionaries back here that you've uh, supported in the Philippines, Brother Ed, you know, no, I preached there several times in my life. Uh, it, it, the, one of the first times we was there, we was having a tent meeting. And, and, I'm, and Brother Ron Garris was with us. And, and I'm telling you what, uh, that tent wasn't as big as this auditorium, hardly. And we, we, we would have uh, 1,000, 1,200 people packed in that little tent. They'd be standing outside looking in the tent at you. First night I preached, and they got ready to give the invitation. They moved out the five, first five rows of chairs in that tent and just shoved them outside. And so people could come up there and kneel, and people would deal with them, and they'd get saved. Amen. Now, man, you talk about getting excited, amen. amen. And this 88-year-old woman comes and gets saved, brother. Amen. And she comes over, and she just says, thank you, thank you for preaching, and kissed me on both cheeks. She didn't have any teeth in her mouth. I knew she was a hillbilly. <laughs> And, and she got saved. And then the next night we're standing there ready, waiting for the service to start. And about, I don't know, 20 minutes, 25 minutes before the service was to start. Here come this lady walking in the gate to the compound. She went home and she would got all of her kids, all of her kids' spouses, all of her grandkids. And she brought them to church that night. And she comes up she said, preacher. I've been telling them all the way here what happened to me last night. Yeah, and she oh. said, a bunch of them want to get saved. Do you think it would be all right if they got saved now? Or do we have to wait till you get done preaching? <laughs> hey, folks, it ought to be emotional with us. It ought to be exciting to us that God's going to use us to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, folks, I don't know about you, but it's also a very spiritually right thing to do. Yeah, sir. It's intellectually right, it's emotionally right, but it's a spiritually thing, yeah. right thing to do. Yeah. He said, Preacher, what are you talking about? Think about what happens when we give, look in verse 5, look in verse 5. He said, and this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. Yeah. And then he said, and then unto us, yeah. by the will of God. There's two key words in there. First, they yeah. gave themselves to the Lord. God is not so much worried about what you've got in your pocket as much as what you've got in your heart. Yeah. yeah. Amen. And he uses this stuff we have in our pockets to teach us spiritual yeah. lessons. Amen. Amen. Faith promise is not just to get missionaries on the field. Faith promise, faith giving is teaching us faith living. It is teaching us spiritual principles that we can live by, amen. amen. That we can walk by faith, that we can trust God, that, that we can see things happen in our life. And so he, he says here, they gave themselves to the Lord. The first thing God wants from you is you. Because yeah. right. yeah. when he has you, everything else is no problem, amen. But when he has you, amen, then he's got everything he needs. And notice how he said they gave themselves unto the Lord. And then he said, and unto us, by the will of God. Yeah. You begin to learn what the will of God is. That's it. See, because we understand God wants us to give, and that's the will of God to give. We can teach a 15-year-old teenager or a nine-year-old child to give to missions to follow the will of God. And when that child grows up and becomes 18, 19, 20 years old, and God says, now the will of God in your life is I want you to go here. Now the will of God is I want you to marry this person. They've learned to make spiritual decisions. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Look what he says a little later. He says in, in chapter 9 when he's explaining this to us, and then I'm going to give you three points. Hang on. Amen. He says in verse number, uh, verse number 10, he said, Now he that ministers seed to the sower, bonus ministers bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Well, that sounds pretty spiritual, doesn't it? Amen. I I'll give you something to think about. I'll guarantee you the guy that never reads his Bible, preacher never gives. Because he doesn't give, he doesn't learn to do spiritual things. So when he reads his Bible for two verses and doesn't have this earth-shattering revelation from God, he quits. Yeah. Yeah. He's getting no bread. Yeah. Right. Wow. 
He said, you minister bread for your food? I don't know about you, but I like it when I sit down and read it. And boy, God says, stop right there. Amen. Amen. Right to look at this verse, amen. amen. My wife and I, back in January, we did something we do every once in a while. And uh, we had COVID the first week and a half in January, so we weren't going very anywhere, anywhere very fast, amen. And so, and I'm over it, don't worry about it, you can shake my hand, amen. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and so we decided, even before that, we'd read our Bibles through in the month of January. And we've done it several times. Amen. Now, it takes, an hour, it takes me an hour and a half in the morning, an hour and a half in the evening to read that through. But you see things. Yep. And it's like God takes the bread. I, I love homemade bread, amen. Amen. But the best time to eat homemade bread is not the next day. Right. Amen. Right. It's the it's seconds after it comes out of the oven. Amen. 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 And you slice it and it's still steaming, and you put the butter on there and it melts and runs off the sides. <laughs> and then you get some of grandma's homemade jam and put on there, amen. And whoo, I'm about to get hungry right there, amen. <laughs> now think. It's like God, he said, you minister bread for your food. And God doesn't give you day-old bread and week-old bread. He said, here, let me give you something that's yeah. still steaming. Amen. amen. Yep. That's spiritual, folks. Yep. But how do I get there? I learned to obey God. Yep. Amen. I learned to walk with God. Yep. God said, I want you to give $20 a week to missions. Okay, God, that's good. That's your will. I'll do that. So all this is right. It's, it's intellectually right. How, how can anybody, how can you even reason in your mind that you can turn your back on a world that needs Christ yeah. and claim to be saved? Yeah. Good. I'm saved, preacher. I, I, I'm, I'm going to heaven. Then what about everybody else? Yeah. When I pastored at that church and we got ready, we had 18 people on the first Sunday and, and a, a few months progressed and I said, okay, if this thing's going to go where God wants it to go, we got to support missions. Amen. And so we brought it up to take on the first missionary and one of the guys got mad. He said, you're throwing away money. And it was the guy that had the most money in the church. <laughs> and I said, we can't neglect the world. It was amazing. He got mad enough to leave. Amen. And then our giving went up. Mm, yeah, how about that? How can you not be moved? Yeah. Amen. How can you not, your emotions not be stirred? How can you not spiritually want to do something? So if you're going to do it, look in chapter 9. Here's the first thing you got to do. Chapter number 9. Notice what he says. In verse number 6, he said, But this I say, he which soweth spare me shall reap also spare me, and he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, yeah. so let him give. Not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves an irritable, grouchy, independent Baptist giver. <laughs> God loveth a cheerful giver. Yeah. So you have to purpose in your heart. After you've got this all in your mind, you make a decision. After you've got it in your heart, you make a decision. After you realize spiritually what I'm going to do, you make a decision. That's what this card's all about. You say, preacher, why should we have to fill out a card? Why should we have to even put the amount down? I'll just give it. Because if you don't purpose in your heart to yeah, do something, yeah. you'll never accomplish anything for God. Amen. Amen. This card simply makes you purpose in your heart between you and God what you're going to do. You see, there's no name on there for your for no place on there for your name. We're not the, the denominational crowd that's going to come by and give you a bill. For, for what you're supposed to give. I, I was talking to a guy the other day. He said he went to this church. I said, I'd leave, amen. Because to join that church, you have to sign a statement how much money you make. Wow. And then the preacher gives you a tithing envelope and expects that 10% of that's in the offering plate every week. If it's not, he comes to your house. 
That's not of God. Amen. Amen. I'm not making a commitment to the church. I'm not Amen. making a commitment to the preacher. I'm making a commitment to God to purpose in my heart. This is what I'm going to do for the cause of Christ. Amen. Amen. So he said, let every man purpose it. Hey, listen, aren't you glad that Jesus Christ, the Bible says, that you, you think about this, you go to the book of Ephesians, don't go there, but you read Ephesians chapter 1, it said God in, the, in eternity past purposed in himself. He knew that he was going to send Jesus Christ yeah. to die for my sins. Amen. Amen. I'm glad he knew what he was going to do, and he did it. Amen. Amen. So this gives you an opportunity. And listen, it's again, it's teaching you spiritual lessons. Amen. If you cannot purpose in your heart to give $20 a week or $30 a week or $50 a month to missions and then do it, guess what? You're not going to purpose in your life to teach a Sunday school class and do it. God's teaching you something right here. Amen. 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 So he's teaching you how to be purposeful in your life. Amen. Amen. How to do what God wants you to do. Amen. And so they did that and they accomplished that. They accomplished what God wants them to do. So first of all, it gives my life a way to learn to purpose, to determine how many people, I, I, I was talking to Sunday school class this morning. How, I wouldn't, I guess I could ask the question here and get in trouble, but I wonder how many of us have actually read our Bible through. Yeah. You say, how did you read your Bible in 30 days? I purposed in my heart. Yeah. I was going to do it. Was it easy in yeah. the midst of COVID? No, it wasn't easy. I didn't feel like setting up. I didn't feel like reading. I didn't feel like doing anything. Mm -hmm. Then we lost our taste, and that made it worse, because when a Baptist can't taste what he's eating, you're in trouble. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how did you get it done? You just decided this is what we're going to do. Yeah. And every morning you're going to get up and you're going to do this. And every evening you're going to sit down and you're going to do this. You're going to turn off the TV. You're going to do that. You're going to accomplish what God wants you to do. Amen. So this team teaches us how to purpose in our lives what the Lord is going to do in our life. Now look in chapter 8, verse 11. This goes right behind it. He said, now therefore, perform the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to will, there, so there may be a performance also out of that which you get. That's good. No, out of that which you have. Yeah, that's it. That widow woman in 1 Kings 17, one of the greatest illustrations of that verse, that widow woman in 1 Kings 17, God told Elijah, you, you're down here at Zarephath, or down here at uh, the Burke Kidron, he said, get up, go over here to Zarephath. I've commanded that woman to sustain you. Good. Read it. So Elijah gets over there, sits down on the edge of the brook there, or the edge of the wall there, or whatever, and this woman coming out to draw water, and he said, Did you give me something to drink? He goes, sure. And she went to get it. He said, as you're going there, give me a, would you bring me a little morsel of bread also? Now to understand, he didn't ask for the whole loaf. He just asked for a little bit, amen. Yep. What was her reaction? As the Lord thy God lived. Not my God, your God. I don't have a bunch of that. I've got a little meal of barrel, a little oil on the cruise, and I've got and these two little sticks. I'm going to go in there and make two cakes, one for me, one for my son, and we're going to die. I've heard that all over America, the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church. We're going to die. For, I'm going to die if I get the missions. Really? <laughs> what did Elijah say? Okay, lady, here's what you do. Purpose in your heart what you're going to do. Yeah. You go in there and you make me a little cake first. Right. And then you perform the doing of it. You bring it unto me. Amen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She could have never saw the miracle of God until she performed the doing of it. Right. And when she brought that cake and gave it to Elijah and went back in, the Bible said that she and Elijah and her house did eat many days. And the barrel mill wasted not, nor the cruise of oil failed till the Lord sent rain on the earth. God's a God that can still put it in the barrel, still put it in the cruise. He's a God that's able to do that. Amen. Amen. What is he waiting for us to do? Perform the doing of it. Right. To purpose in my heart, this is what I'm going to do. 
And I'm going to perform the doing of it. So come next Sunday, you start performing the doing of it. Come next month, you perform the doing of it. Yeah. Come next summer, you perform the doing of it. And you get you get used and accustomed to performing what God told you to do. Amen. Amen. Here's that spiritual lesson. Amen. How many people start down the road for God and quit? Young. Same crowd that makes a faith promise and never gives it. How many times I heard a preacher say, well, our commitment last year was 40,000. We only got 35. Why? Because you didn't do it. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, he says, I think it's verse 9, he said, the things that thou hast learned and seen and heard and received in me, then he stops and said, and do. Just do it. Amen. Perform the doing of it. And it's not you sitting around. I, I've heard this preached all over America. That, well, faith promises this. You tell God you'll give $100 a month to God. And you sit around all month waiting for God to mysteriously somehow give you $100. Huh? That's not what that widow woman had to do. No, she, Elijah didn't say, okay. You go in there and you wait for the meal to get in that barrel. When you get in the meal in that barrel, come make, go make me a cake and bring it. Mm -hmm. No, he said, you bring it. You do it first. So, you perform the doing of it. Right. That's what Jesus, I think that's what Jesus was trying to get across to us. And, and these things when he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. And all these things, they were asking about food. They were asking about raiment. They were asking about a place to stay. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Just do what I tell you to do and the rest of it will take care of itself. Amen. Amen. So you see, it's, it's a purpose in our life and then we must perform the doing of it. Yes. But understand something. Go back to chapter number nine. He says in verse 7, he told us that we're to purpose in our heart what we're going to give. And then he says in verse 8, and God is able. Amen. Amen. We could stop right there and preach yeah. for the next hour. Amen. Amen. There is a provision coming, folks. Amen. Yeah. When you purpose in your heart what you're going to do and you perform the doing of it, there is a provision coming. What is that provision? And God is able. And I love that verse. He said, that, and he's able what? To make all grace abound towards you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound in every good work. He didn't say you're going to suffer. He didn't say you're going to lack. He said you're going to have sufficiency. Doesn't mean you're going to move into a big house. Doesn't mean you're going to bring a new car, but he's going to be sufficient for what you need. Amen. Amen. And when you tie that together, Paul said, let me tell you something. Here's how it all ties together. A few chapters later, he said, I tell you what, I got this thorn in the flesh and I besought the Lord to get rid of it. But he said, the God instructed me and taught me that his grace is sufficient. Amen. There's a provision coming. And you got things that are greater in your life that you need God's provision for than just money in a bank account. Come on. Food on your table. There's going to be days when the devil's attacking. There's going to be days when the doctor says cancer. There's going to be days when they call and there's been a car wreck. And you're going to need God to provide his grace. And he's trying to teach you how to find it. And God is able. Amen. God's not feeble. That's right. God's not sitting in a chair, needs a walker and a cane to get up. Amen. Amen. I, I got, I, that verse became real to me a few years ago when I was walking around with an air cast on one leg and a cane in the other hand and struggling to get up out of chairs. And I'm thinking, God is able. He's not restricted. He is not limited. He is not anywhere close to being incapable. He is God. Amen. 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 Can I tell you, America better wake up. Come on. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And the Christians in America better wake up. Just, Come because, on. just yeah. because Donald Trump's not president doesn't mean God's incapable yeah. of doing yeah. what he needs to do. Amen. Come on. Yeah. That's good. A bunch of Christians sitting around moaning and groaning and yeah. belly aching. Hey, what are we going to do? I'll tell you what you're going to do. What you should have been done, been doing Come for on. the last 20 years. Trust God. Yeah. yeah. And he's been trying to teach you that through faith promise. Mm. Huh? Amen. Amen. Wow. 
God will provide. Yes. Amen. I read that verse to the Sunday school class today. You get to Matthew chapter 10, he sends them out. He said, you just go and they don't be taken care of. You get to Luke chapter 22 and verse 35. And he said, when I sent you without script or purse, lacked ye anything? And they said, nothing. Amen. Nothing. I'll make you a promise on the word of God and by 46 years of lifetime experience, the more you do for God, the more God will do for you. Yeah. But you don't give to give from God. No. You give because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. But then watching God, watch God. I've, I've preached this, and a young preacher that I know, him and his wife were having their first child. They had limited insurance. The baby came. It came time for them to discharge the baby. And he said to his wife, he said, I'm going downstairs to the office. Make arrangements how we're going to have to pay this off to how we're going to do it. But we're going to have to pay this off and make arrangements and make payments on this. So he went down to the business office. Told the lady who he was. Said they're getting ready to discharge my wife. She said, yeah, she put all that stuff in the computer. And he goes, I, you have any idea what we will owe and how I can set up payments to payment, pay it? She looked at it and she goes, you don't know anything. He said, what? She said, somebody came in this morning and paid it all. Mm -hmm. And God is able. Yeah. yeah. And God is able. And God, that not make anybody get excited, amen. amen. There's them emotions, and the emotions are all right, amen. amen. It's spiritually right to do what you're doing. It's intellectually right. I am more convinced in my mind than I ever had. 46 years ago, my wife and I got married. The first things we started doing was tithing and giving to missions, tithing and giving to missions. 46 years, we have did that faithfully, faithfully, faithfully. God's delivered us from burning airplanes. I walked down the alley on the street between a wall and a church in the Philippines, sat down in a chair to drink something, and a man shot a cobra snake in that very alley about three minutes after I walked down that alley. What? God's able. See, God is sending you down a path of spiritual lessons. Have you learned them? Yeah. Are you learning them? And can I say this and I'm done? If you just consented to give what you gave last year, guess what? Your life is what it was last year. Mm -hmm. Spiritually, faith wise. If you're not stepping ahead in this area, you're not going to step ahead in your prayer life. You're not going to step ahead in your Bible reading. You're not going to step ahead in your service for God. Because you can't trust God to take care of it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all you've done in our lives. morning an invitation to do what only you can do in our lives. May we learn the lessons you're trying to teach us today when it comes to giving the faith promise. Now bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to go over here and pray. I just want to know how to pray for you. You say, preacher, pray for me. God spoke to my heart today some things I need to do. Anybody like that today said, preacher, just pray for me today. God bless your hearts. God bless your hearts. God bless your hearts. Will you be obedient to the Lord, will you please?